Hey everyone, Sergeant Arterbright here. And today we're going to be reacting to Napoleon's Marshals Part 1. I didn't really think this video was going to be that relevant. It, it just seems like a, sort of like a minor topic, but apparently a few of you wanted me to react to it. So I'll go ahead and do that. And also, you know, it's a pretty cool series. And hopefully this episode will also be pretty cool. And it came out in July 30th of this year. So it's entirely possible that they might come out with a part two very soon. So I found out that these episodes are not are not in like the correct order at all. Waterloo, the Waterloo episode was made five years ago. While um, now on Napoleon's Endgame episode, which was about eighteen fourteen, one year before Waterloo, was made a couple months ago or a few months ago. So, yeah, it's funny. Terror belly, decus bacchus. Terror in war, ornament in peace. Hmm. Cool. Words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. Baton? They could... Okay, that's weird. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal... Oh, look at that beautiful hair. ...goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. Oh, the wow, look at that stick. Look, it's a, it's a thing. And, yeah, it has things. The pull was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible <laughs> with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. Cool. That year, he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. Yeah, even though some of them, like this guy over here, would betray him. Eight more were created in the years that followed. The marshals outranked lot. everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes, and ministers of state. And Napoleon, too. Uh, really? That darn cat, he, like, opens the door. Seriously, I don't understand they came from every background. Sons of aristocrats and innkeepers. Professional soldiers and those who'd learned on the job. Old school Republicans and Bonaparte loyalists. The youngest, just half the age of the oldest. Wow, only 34. Then again, Napoleon was also extremely young. And though Marshal was a civil title, not strictly a military rank. The men known to the army as Les Gros Bonnets, the Big Hats, the were our... Oh yes, the Big Hats. That's what we should call them in the United States. Oh yes, the Big Hats. Hello, Big Hats. Yeah. Arguably yeah. the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant, and flawed group of military commanders in history. The most favored were showered with titles and wealth. But the price, too, was high. Half were wounded, three were killed or died of wounds. Two were executed. Rude. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. How'd you execute Napoleon's Marshals, but not Napoleon? All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as oh. Marshals. With expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Port, former Chief Historian of the French Army. More than 2,000 French generals served in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. What? Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. What about the others? Bertrand, Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who commanded 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. Clausel. Wait, is this going best to worst or worst to best? A veteran commander of the war in Spain. Desay, 
Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Oh, yeah. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. Oh, wow. Gerard, one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814, made a marshal by King Louis-Philippe in 1830. Goudon, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Oh, oh Juno, no. who first served with Napoleon at Toulon in 17... Oh my gosh, all these people are dying. 93, probably committed suicide after his fall from favor in 1813. Lassau, oh, his fall from favor? The Hussar General. Among the best light cavalry commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, killed at Wagram, age 34. Maison, who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, made marshal by King Charles Dang. X in 1829. Nonsuti, the heavy cavalry commander who died. Oh, he died at the last year. That is, that sucks. Of wounds and exhaustion, age 46. Why does it just randomly give him his age? Not anyone else. Saint Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz, died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. Van Damme. I thought it said only like three, three of them died. This is like. Okay, I can't see the that one or that. I can't see this one or this one because they're covered up. But let's see. One. Okay, I can't even of see them. Napoleon properly. once said, if I had to invade. One, two, three. Oh, I can't even see it. Two, three, four, five. That's five already. Hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. Oh. And that. Six. That's six guys who have died. Oh, Napoleon's 26 marshals, ranked in order of merit. Oh, that's the best to worst, or to best. Also, maybe it said like three. Died in battle, I don't remember. 26. Marshal Perignon. When Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, four were honorary marshals, recognized for past service to France. Perignon was one of these. Oh. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He mm. later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief return, I don't really get it. France can freaking defeat, like, win a revolution and fight against literally everyone on the freaking continent at the same time. But then you get the situation in 1814 where it's very similar. Napoleon gets completely destroyed. Like, I know there's a lot of other factors at play, but it just seems quite interesting. And he was sent to Italy and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi, where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians, and Perignon was badly wounded and captured. His appointment as honorary marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by emphasizing continuity with the revolution, by rewarding its military heroes. Perignon never held active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma, and later Naples. His eldest son, Pierre, was a cavalry officer, killed at Friedland in 1807. Perignon retired in 1813, who had refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815 what? and was stripped of his marshal's baton. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. Screw you. Also, I thought they did away with that whole routine. Why did they bring it back? Like, why did the same people that got rid of it decide to bring it back? 25. Marshal Brew. <laughs> He was justly proclaimed the savior of the Batavian Republic by saving Holland. He also saved France from invasion. Hmm. Brun was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. 
as a fiery Republican and former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges de... Oh, boy. His support was politically useful for Napoleon. Brun joined the army during the Terror, the most extreme period of the revolution. His political connections ensured rapid promotion, and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris with the famous whiff of grape shot. Brun then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early victories. He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander and enthusiastic plunderer of Italian towns and churches. Oh, that's not nice. In 1798, he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland, while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes, the equivalent of several million dollars today. Wow! How do you even invade Switzerland, by the way? Like, there's so many freaking... Like, there's a giant lake, I think, or something like that, where, where, where France is. Or two, actually. Um, two or three. And also, it's, like, all mountainy. How do you do that? Like, like how do you do that? The Swiss, the Swiss have so many advantages. Like, how do you... How do you go through Switzerland? And why would you go through Switzerland, by the way? What's the point? What... What good does it give you? I... Uh, it just seems like a waste of time. Like, yes, you got money. But that's not very... But that... Like, that, that just contributes to inflation of your currency. It was said that Brun's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. Wow. The next year he won his most important victory while commanding French forces in Holland, defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castrico and saving France from invasion. Wow. But a short calamitous spell commanding Oh, so also by the way, I don't like it when the army people... of I don't like it when people call the Netherlands Holland. Because, like, I already had a whole rant about this, but Holland is literally just one of the, like, s states of Netherlands. Like, there's South Holland and North Holland. It would be like calling the United States of America Dakota. Because there's st South Dakota and North Dakota. It it's dumb. The yeah, it's the Netherlands. And also, it's interesting. So... They're calling the Netherlands the Batavian Republic. That's a okay. That's interesting. That's how did they name it that? Of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brun was not fit for high command. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, where in 1804 oh. he learned that he'd been made a marshal. Oh, cool. But Brun's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self-importance did not make him a successful diplomat. Darn. He was recalled to France. You donkey. But as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again, drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French emperor. Whether a deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious. Rude. Brun was sacked. Rude, rude, rude you donkey. Brun yeah. spent the next Hopefully seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814 and rallied That's to Napoleon good. when he returned from exile the next year. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brune was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered, and tossed into the River Rhone. Jeez, rude. 24. Marshal Serrurier. Okay, listen to it and then look how... Okay. Look how you think it's going to be pronounced. You think it's going to be like Serrier, but no. Twenty-four, Marshal Serrier. Serrier. Just so weird. I don't. I'll never understand it. Oh yeah, I forgot to read this. He retained all the characteristics and severity of an infantry major, an honest man with integrity and reliability, but unfortunate as a general. Oh. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognize for past service. 
That's why a lot of these marshals aren't that good. I seem to think that the worst marshals are there for political reasons, you know, because they're they've been served in the past, I guess. Um, yeah. In contrast to Brun, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school, a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and a stern disciplinarian. This background... Uh, how old is he? A veteran of the Seven Years' War? How old are you? It was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognized as assets to the new French Republic. Mm, cool. By 1795, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy. Oh, where nice. his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname the Virgin of Italy. Serrurier was a reliable... Jeez, imagine being called that. That is just sad. Or if unspectacular commander, who won oh. an important victory at Mondovi at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, Fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'etat of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command. But Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal and governor of Les Invalides the retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. What? Wait, I'm confused. Governor of Les Invalides. So you made him the governor of a retirement place? That is so weird. Okay, then. The retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. There, shortly before the fall of Paris. Hotel des... In the Valadez. In 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards. Oh yeah, that! Remember guys? They like burned all of the like important artifacts, so that way they wouldn't go in the hands of the Allies. To prevent them falling into Allied hands. 23. Marshal <laughs> Kellerman. Wow, it looks like that will be a German. Look at his last name, Kellermann. I think I was probably the boldest general who ever lived. But even I wouldn't have dared to take post there. Napoleon on Kellermann's command post at Battle of Valmy. Oh. Kellermann was another honorary marshal, the oldest at 68, and famed throughout France as the savior of the revolution. A career soldier from a middle-class background, he'd seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. Wow. At the beginning... Going from middle class to a marshal of the French Empire must be very cool. ...of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Régime. But at Valmy, in September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Center stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Nice. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history oh, that no. saved the infant French Republic. I need to charge when my the computer. revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links, spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. Acquitted and restored to command, he was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy, when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer, then in favor of a rising new talent, General Bonaparte. General Bonaparte. Okay, then. Look at that hair. Kellerman later specialized in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as president of the Senate. His son, 
General Francois Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. 22. Marshal Grouchy. Marshal Grouchy. Oh. His conduct was as unforeseeable as if his army on the march had been struck by an earthquake and swallowed up. Napoleon on Grouchy's failure to march to its aid during the Battle of Waterloo. I think y'all told me about that. In the comments. When Napoleon returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment, Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution, Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars, fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. Oh, Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a Dragoon division in Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He was praised by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Eylau. Played an important role buying time for Napoleon at Friedland. And expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. You could stop by opening the doors. invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps and was wounded at Borodino. Oh yeah, Borodino, we talked about that. About giant metal. Hey, you clips. Come on. Silly sausage. He silly survived sausage. the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. Months? He returned. To sleep. You won't be tired anymore. You know, that's how you. Ah, okay. Sorry, though. <laughs> for Napoleon's let's, let's 1814 campaign in France, and was wounded twice more. Grouchy was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign and commanded Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Russians to prevent anymore. them joining up with Wellington's Anglo Allied army. Oh, Two yeah. days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders rather than march to join Napoleon. Ah, oh, you sausage. And it's been widely blamed yeah, for the... You didn't really care for uh, You silly dude. Come on, what are you doing? French Emperor's defeat ever since. I guess Eclipse wants to be the star of the show now. He wants to react to the video. Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair. Not least because... Obscure the distinguished hey, record I, of one of the Grand like Armies. up the computer. No. No, stop. Stop it. Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders rather than march to join Napoleon, yeah. and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. Oh. Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair. Not yeah, guys, don't be mean to him. That's just rude. Not least because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to keep slapping me in the face with his tail. Show initiative, and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Nor should one blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grand Armée's best cavalry generals. So he was just. He was a good general. He just was too uptight, I guess you could say. Oh, he keeps zooming in. Stop it. Stop. Get away. This cat. Can you get off of my computer? Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape royalist reprisals, but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. There we go. Oh, cool. 21. Marshal Monsey. Monsey. He was an honest man. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. let's go together. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. What? Oh, I'm 15. I might as well go ahead and run away and become a marshal. 
to the Napoleonic Wars. That should be fun. What? Who does? Why would you do that? What? That's so ridiculous. What? I, I, I don't... Why would you... What? What? Why? Why would someone do that, though? Okay, I don't... I don't get it. Why would you purposely, like, run and join the army? Okay, I'd like to see you. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. But then... Hey, that's still pretty nice. ...came the French Revolution. Most French officers were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. The result was that three-quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reaped the benefit with meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monsey was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish on what was admittedly a relative backwater of the Revolutionary Wars. In 1797, he was dismissed for alleged royalist sympathies, but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. By his own admission, Monse was a sensitive officer, honest, honorable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. Napoleon was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804 as part of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed Inspector General of the Gendarmerie, France's militarized police force, and spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. Militarized police force, isn't that like the National Guard? He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, operating in the south of the country with mixed success. In 1809, he was replaced by General Junot and returned to France. Monse's finest hour came in the dying days of the empire, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defense of the French capital. In 1815, the restored King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monsey to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Monsey regarded Ney as a hero for having saved so many French lives in Russia and refused, declaring, if I am not allowed... Well, that is very nice of him. Out to save my country, nor my own life, then at least I will save my honor. After a short spell in prison, Monse was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St. Helena. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, but anyways, guys, if you want to join, if you want to, like, ever run away from your home and join the army, you know, that's cool. I, that's, I think that's the lesson we've got from this video. You know, you, you might, who knows, you might become a marshal of Napoleon himself during the Napoleonic Wars, who knows? Which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St. Helena in 1840. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monse announced, And now, let us go home to die. Wait, what? 20. Marshal Poniatowski. A man of noble character, brimming over with honor and bravery. Napoleon. Prince Josef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew, but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army, even serving as aide de camp to Emperor Josef II himself. In 1789, he transferred to the Polish army with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by its rapacious neighbors, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. By 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat... Oh, jeez, fine. How did this happen? Well, they kept trying to open the door again.
for the fourth time. For the third time. No, y'all guys look and see. Okay. Stop it. John can't. I swear, it's in a comic. Anyways. I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Like, how do they even do that? What? I, I, when countries can just randomly partition each other, why didn't it happen before or after? It's, it's, like, this is just, it's like the most ridiculous thing ever. Like, yeah, we're just gonna take over the land, and we can't say anything about it, because we're already in it. Swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Russia in 1806. Oh, look at that guy right there, he has his... Is his head off. Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Somber, serious, and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. Nice. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish Fifth Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically. Also, look what my cat did to me. Look at that. You like. I don't know, like my hand, you know, just dropping, you know, on the side of my bed. And then he came up and just like jumped up and like whoosh, grabbed my arm with both of his hands and just kept biting over and over again. Like seriously, I, I, I don't get it. He just likes to attack me randomly. And like, I don't know, I guess he likes to play. It's weird. But yeah, he did that to me last night in my blood. It's a very rude. Throughout the campaign, motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. <laughs> but by the end of the retreat, Fifth Corps had been virtually destroyed. One oh no. Nyatowski remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813 and was given command of the Polish Eighth Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon in recognition of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. Boniatowski was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honor. Wow. Maybe not ethnically, because like... Kellerman seems like he's ethnically German, even though his nationality is French. Also, look, he, he's so stylish. Look at his clothes. He's wearing all red. He's so snazzy. He and his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. Cool. At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rear guard. But their only escape route, a bridge over the Elster River, was right. blown up too soon. Oh, no, Badly wounded, donkey. Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river. Oh, we're talking about this, it's so sad. But he was swept from his saddle and drowned. He had been a marshal for just four days. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. But Poniatowski... That's weird to think about. For a century. Wow. His legend lived on. A model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. That's cool. Marshal Jordan. Marshal Jordan. Oh yeah, okay. I certainly use. Oh, I certainly use that man very ill. 
Rodon is a true patriot, and that is the answer to many things that have been said about him. Many things that have been said about him. Before. As a young French private, Jordan saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War. Ooh. But he then caught a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. When the French Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit, fought at the battles of Gemap, that is an interesting flight. And Honshouto, and was rapidly promoted to general. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable nice. for the French Army's use of balloon reconnaissance, oh. the first effective use of an aircraft in military history. Wow, um, seems like he'd be shot down pretty fast. Jourdan became a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalized France's policy of mass conscription. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, but his fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. When Joseph became king of Spain in 1808, Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. But the situation in Spain would prove beyond Jourdan's military skills to solve. Darn. He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals in Spain. Theoretically under Jourdan's command, but who repeatedly ignored his orders and openly questioned his competence. Marshal Soult in Andalusia was a prime offender, while Marshal Victor's insubordination at the Battle of Talavera contributed directly to the French defeat. Struck by another bout of ill health, Jourdan went home to recover. Two years later, he returned to Spain. But at the Battle of Vittoria in 1813, he and King Joseph Wait, Vittoria? That's a weird name. were outmaneuvered and decisively beaten by Wellington, leading to the collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jordan never held a major command again, but his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognized and respected. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monse, Onyatovsky, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Join us for part two when we'll continue the countdown. Wow. Um, that was very interesting. Also slightly boring, but that's okay. Um, it t told us a lot of interesting facts, um, and, and yeah, I, th I th also think it would be interesting to react to their World War I series, because World War I is such a cool war, to be honest, in my opinion, it's such a cool war, a lot of people fought, a lot of people died, cool weapons, cool uniforms, cool countries, um, I think someone else wanted me to react to another series. I'll get to that. Also, it turns out my strategy worked. Go to the very end of the video and replay it, and there'll be no ads. Apparently, it didn't work last time, but whatever. Anyways, goodbye. Hello, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe to my channel. And, you know, turn on the notification bell thingy. And if you didn't, then make sure to leave a uh, thumbs down. Oh yeah, that would be greatly appreciated. And while you're at it, go ahead and watch my other videos. They're probably just as good, at them, if not better, than this one right now. Except for my oldest videos, don't watch those. And, you know, subscribe to these people down here, my fellow sergeants. They're other YouTubers that I either know or I have in high regards. Yeah, even my cat agrees, so...
Thank you for watching, and have a great day.